if, if you wake up one morning and you find yourself in a society where 23 year olds with four year college degrees and like initiative who aren't smoking weed every day, if they can't make enough to buy a car, much less a home, much less get married, much less have children, then why should you be surprised when half of them say they prefer socialism? Well, I, you should not be I, so surprised. I agree to a certain extent. I think that the, the, the question is when the pedal hits the metal, like you, you talk in the, in the book about technology and how it's shifting and taking away jobs from folks. Yes. And you make specific reference to truck driving and the fact yes. that there are going to be these automated cars on the roads. So would you, Tucker Carlson, be in favor of restrictions on the ability of trucking companies to use this sort of technology specifically to, you know, sort of artificially maintain the number of jobs that are available in the trucking industry? Are you joking? In a no. second. In a second. In other words, if I were president, what I say to DOT, Department of Transportation, we're not letting driverless trucks on the road, period. Why? Really simple. Driving for a living is the single most common job for high school educated men in this country, in all 50 states. By the way, that's the same group whose wages have gone down by 11% over the past 30 years. The social cost of eliminating their jobs in a 10-year span, 5-year span, 30-year span is so high that it's not sustainable. So the greater good is protecting your citizens from, look, capitalism is the best economic system I can think of, I think that anyone's ever thought of. But that doesn't mean that it's a religion and everything about it is good. No, but, but There's no I, Nicene creed of capitalism that I have to buy into. What I care about is living in a country where, you know, decent people can live happy lives, actually. And so, no, I would say, immediately, no, are you joking? And I maybe would make up some pretext for public consumption, like, oh, they're dangerous. The technology is not quite finessed. No, no. But the truth would be, I don't want to put 10 million men out of work so this, because you're going to have 10 million dead families and the cascading effect from that will wreck your country. So I, I'm going to ask about the limiting principle there in just a second. So back to the, the technology question. So it's, it's fascinating to me uh, that you're so willing to restrict technology in this particular area. Not because it's not a justifiable policy. Not, not willing. I would Eager be to. Yeah. Thrilled so to do that. So what's the limiting principle? Because obviously jobs are lost in industries through creative destruction and have been for the entire time the free market has of existed. Right? I mean, wheelwrights lost their jobs when, when the automobile was, was right. created. What's to prevent this principle that you're speaking up from just becoming Ludditism? That technology is destroying jobs? Well, I don't think Ludditism technology. is insane. I mean, there were massive costs to the Industrial Revolution. Half but but you say you're a fan of capitalism and development. Am, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have am, all the cool stuff we have, right? I mean, maybe, yeah. Well, look, I'm for capitalism. I'm for machines, right? You know, they they all but guarantee I'll live way longer than my great grandparents. I, I get it. I'm for machines, okay? I'm just saying that there was a cost. Half the world was enslaved for 70 years under Bolshevism because those countries didn't manage. I would argue the transition from an agrarian economy into an industrial one. That's what that was, okay? So we're on the cusp of a completely transformative revolution as or more transformative as the industrial revolution. And no one is trying to take control of it at all or figure out how to channel these forces into an outcome that we want to live with realistically. Uh, and because they're not, you're going to see reactions and you're already seeing reactions against this stuff that are flat out extreme. So the model, again, is Teddy Roosevelt, who was a capitalist, a patriot, a man of deep faith. He was not anti-business, and yet he restrained American businesses. He broke them up and was hated for doing it in the service of a higher goal, which was a stable, happy country where the traditions could be preserved. If he didn't do that, you know, there's, there's no telling, like, what would have happened to the, the Wobbly, you know, the IWW or whatever. We could have gone in a totally different direction. I mean, so I will admit, I'm not a Teddy Roosevelt fan, and I would have opposed the trust busting. But when it comes to the, when it comes to the sort of politics we're talking about, I guess my major question is, is it a contributing factor to societal unrest to tell people that politics is to blame for the problem? Are we are we edging on political messianism? The idea that yeah. if we just change a couple of policies yes. here or there, yes. then we'll be able to fix everything. When the reality is that, as you talk about a little bit in the book, what we may be suffering from is an actual spiritual malaise. And maybe economics has something to do with it. I would argue that it has a lot more to do with a generalized move away from yeah. social fabric driven by of all of the factors I mean, that used to exist in churches and, and all of these things. And that if we're going to, if we are going to maintain both freedom and stability, 
you know, the, the John Adams formulation was that this Constitution was only built for a moral and virtuous people. It wasn't built for any other. Got it. There are two ways to actually tackle that. One is to say we are no longer moral and no longer virtuous, so we have to change the freedom. And the other is to say, well, if we want to maintain the freedom, we have to become moral and virtuous again. And I wonder if we as public figures, because we're in the same business more or less, where we ought to be putting our focus. Should we be putting our focus on justifying people's fears about the economy and suggesting that a political messiah is around the corner? Or should we be saying to people, listen, the industry in your town may be dying. And as a temporary stopgap, perhaps we can stop technology from advancing. Perhaps we can stop trade from eating your job. Or should we be saying to people, listen, America was built by folks who crossed mountains to go to the middle of nowhere in pure risk. And you are guaranteed nothing in the United States but the adventure of your life. There are 7 million unfilled jobs. Maybe we need to actually move. Maybe you need to go to North Dakota and get a fracking right. job. Yeah, leave Yeah, leave your parents' graves in the town you grew up in to move to some solar city and become a cog in some yeah, thing. Well, I mean, no. that, that's I mean, the biblical mandate, leave the land that you've known and yeah, go to some I mean, place for adventure. I, yeah. I don't know. I, it's, a, it's a mixture of both. And I, and I would, to answer your initial question, anyone who argues that any of this is going to be fixed by a person or a bill that makes its way through Congress or new Supreme Court justice is lying to you. That's a grotesque and dishonest oversimplification of the sort that politicians and, by the way, talk show hosts specialize in. And so the, to the extent I played a role in lying about that, I'm sorry. I never want to be that guy. I always want to acknowledge how complex and multifaceted all of these problems are because they are. I'm merely making a couple of very obvious observations. That there are downsides to this We stuff. are not <laughs> servants of our economic system. We are not here to service shareholders. We're human beings. And our concerns are real. Now, they must be balanced against the concerns of shareholders and lots of other concerns. But to say that, you know, if it's more efficient to have you move to some crappy suburb to serve some douchey company because that's what you know, is best to increase value. It's like, it's okay for me to stand up and say, you know, there are other concerns here, actually. And there's a social cost to doing that. Anyway, this all used to be obvious. These things were actually debated during the Industrial Revolution. The Luddites are used for propaganda purposes to make the other side seem ludicrous. You're literally smashing machines. You're a dummy. You're an animal. You know what I mean? But actually, the concern is totally real. If... You spend, I don't know, just like roughly 5,000 years in one kind of economy that changes incrementally over time, but basically living from what you grow, living with your family and working 100 yards away for thousands of years. And then in the space of, I don't know, 100 years after the steam engine is invented, everything is completely different. That's a lot. It doesn't mean that you should stop it or smash the machines with a hammer, but it means you should be thoughtful in the way you channel these awesome forces these awesome economic forces, you are not a servant to them. They are tools that thoughtful people use to increase the goodness of their society. So I guess I'm just so struck by like, if I would ever talk to liberals or conservatives, market fundamentalists in Washington, they're like, well, we can't stop. This is technology. It's inexorable. Like we have really no role in it other than to try to benefit from it. It's like, really? You're talking about machines. Are they really in charge? No, we're in charge. We're human beings with free will. God created us to make these decisions. No, but there is a, there is a balance, obviously, between increasing prosperity across all of humankind, which has really been the result of free market capitalism over the past 40 years, and redistribution of the benefits, because the benefits obviously fall upon people deeply Look, unequal. I'm not for taking stuff from people. I don't want my stuff to be taken from me. But I regulations do that effectively. I mean, President Trump has been the, very anti-regulatory I because guess of this. in a broad sense... I, Maybe, I guess. I mean, I know that that's a talking point. I'm not exact. I mean, yeah, a lot of regulations are unbelievably stupid and they benefit, you know, certain categories of rent seeker at the expense of everyone else. Like I'm very aware. I live among it. I know. And a lot of this is totally corrupt and counterproductive. Okay. For sure. On the other hand, you, we have an obligation to think deeply about what's best for normal people. That's all I'm saying. That's, that's it. That's all I'm saying. And we are not powerless in the face of these forces. And if we decide that we are powerless in the face of them, we're all just along for the ride. We're not the authors of history. We're merely just flotsam floating atop it. It's like, whoa, that's a totally different way of thinking about it that's really bad. And as we go through these changes, the people benefiting most, to whom much is given, much is expected. 
they should feel an obligation to those beneath them in the way you feel to your well, that's children. Cer- that's certainly, employees. I feel, I mean, you know, they should feel guilty. That's why charity exists, but. Exactly. 